If it were not for the Holy Spirit, there are times when standing here to preach, after experiencing the repeat injustices from my perspective of our country and our world, there's times when that would be impossible. Yet still I rise. After the Supreme Court, no, let me be clear, after the conservative majority of the Supreme Court, let me be clearer, quoting just about all of the news outlets willing to report this or point this out, after all six justices appointed by Republican presidents voted to overturn affirmative action in college admissions, and the three justices appointed by Democratic presidents voted to maintain affirmative action, but obviously did not prevail. I literally cried. Justices, and I don't like putting that word in front of their names, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, ended affirmative action in college admissions. Affirmative action, a tool used to counter the racism potentially present in most predominantly white institutions and to aid the building of a diverse student body. Affirmative action, a policy whose goal was to include those traditionally excluded from spaces that would aid their uplift, the uplift of their community, and quite frankly, the uplift of the predominantly white space for people of color add context, brilliance, and diverse thought. As young people say, where's the lie? Affirmative action, which I am sure I and many of my African American colleagues gained access to spaces where we deserved to be anyway. Affirmative action in college admissions ended on Thursday. Believe it or not, I'm better today than I was on Thursday. I cried from the pain of feeling attacked, personally, once again, and from the pain of watching hatred and discrimination prevail in the highest court, in my opinion. A court which is supposed to be nonpartisan, is currently very partisan, and the move hurt me to my core, and I almost did not want to preach today. I actually wanted to flip the script and hear from you, and I still want to hear from you. What do you think about that decision? Do you think we live in a post-racial society? Do you think that racism no longer prevents the upward mobility of black and brown people still trying to rise from a legacy of trauma, discrimination, undereducation, incarceration, and economic disenfranchisement? Do you think justice was done? The God we serve says do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. I wanted to hear from you, and I still want to hear from you. What do you think about what happened? Do you see the harm of ending affirmative action? What else do you think the conservative court will overturn? They overturned Roe v. Wade, affirmative action, Biden's loan forgiveness plan. They awarded a victory to a made-up situation for a so-called Christian business to be able to discriminate against LGBTQ couples. 
these people are in office, in, in, in court, for the rest of their lives. How do you feel about it? Did it put a pit in your stomach like it put in mine? Did you shed a tear like I shed many? I did not want to preach another sermon about injustice. I did not want to say yet again that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I didn't want to stand here and say that once again when that arc once again bent away from justice. Yet I rose, and still I rise. Thank you, Trinity. I rise because there is a word in the scriptures selected today, scriptures selected before the overturning and my stomach turning. There is a word in Genesis 22, a scripture about a patriarch of our faith, Abraham, who was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. A scripture chosen before the events of last week because it is the lectionary scripture for today, which means it was chosen in the 1980s to fall on today. And is as relevant as any scripture to the injustices of last week. So let's go to the biblical text. After these things, verse 1 says, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of the, his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, set out, and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. Skip down to verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Sacrificing a child seems unfathomable. Likely a custom, a tradition of the time this sacred text was written. Many scholars say the scripture can be understood as God's word of disapproval of child sacrifice. This is complicated because the verse, verse 2 says that God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. But then fast forward to verse 12, God's angel told Abraham right in the nick of time not to slay his son, yet still affirmed Abraham's willingness to do so. What's that all about? The tension in the text is a moral dilemma. A reader leaves unclear about whether God is for or against sacrificing children. In the end, God stops Abraham. Yet in the end, God again affirms his willingness to do it. Beyond trying to make sense of all of that, here's what I see and what I always see about the Bible. I see the biblical text as a mirror to humanity. I see it as a mirror of the human condition. I believe it shows the propensities of humanity, what we're capable of at our worst, and what we're capable of at our best. And as I get older and continue to speak and strive for justice, it seems to me that life is a continuation of humans at their worst, and humans at their best. It's all drama. And what I know for sure is that often and unfortunately, children get caught up in and harmed by adult drama. We're going to tweet that this week. It's true in the scripture. It's true in life. First in the scripture. Isaac, innocent, trusting, and dependent on his father Abraham, was almost sacrificed, almost killed by Abraham because of Abraham's beliefs, convictions, and state of mind. Now the text tells us that Abraham loved Isaac. 
But as the late Tina Turner so famously said, and may she rest in peace, what's love got to do with it? The reality is that Isaac was caught up in the adult drama of his father, Abraham, who was willing to end his son's life because of his beliefs, convictions, and state of mind. And the Bible basically tells us that even his love for his son did not stop him from being willing to sacrifice him because of his adult beliefs, convictions, and state of mind. And isn't this a mirror for life? That often and unfortunately children get caught up in adult drama. That's what happened this past Thursday in the Supreme Court decision that ended affirmative action for college admissions. The children, mostly children of color, are once again caught up in adult drama because of the beliefs, convictions, and state of mind of those who sit on the Supreme Court. Beliefs, convictions, and states of mind that have recently made decision after decision impacting the rights of marginalized groups to protect the privilege, pacify the fear, and uphold the supremacy of whiteness and wealth in our country. Drama that these adults bring with them to their seats, and as a result, children have been harmed. Adults, we need to understand a few things about this reality. It is not okay with God. I'm grateful that the storyline in Genesis stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. Now, if we can just get adults to stop impacting the lives of children through drama. If only our elected officials can finally find funding for education, especially in the public education system to reflect the priority and equality that it deserves. If only all educators can believe that all children can learn and achieve and succeed. If only adults can figure out how in the world to stop school shootings and community shootings that take the lives of children every day in our country. If only adults can figure out how to make college education affordable so the students don't end up in five and six figure debt before they hit 21. Children can't change gun laws. Only adults can. Children can't stop gun trafficking in the black community. Only adults can. Children can't change rising tuition and unfair admission practices. Only adults can do that. Children can't fix up our education. Only adults can do that, and I believe the biblical text is trying to teach us adults that God is not okay with children being caught up in the drama of adults whose egos are fragile and who have fear of replacement so that they are in self-preservation mode and making decisions that will stand for decades in an attempt to preserve supremacy. Children of all races, creeds, and ethnicities should have the right to live and grow and flourish, and our nation can't seem to guarantee that right and have no problem sacrificing our most vulnerable citizens. If it means people can hold on to their gun rights and their right to deny an education, the biblical text is teaching us today that as adults, we have a propensity to sacrifice children. And we might even feel justified as Abraham was acting on his strongest convictions. But in the end, God stopped it. God was not okay with it. And if it's not okay with God, it should not be okay with us. But here's the other lesson in the biblical text. Children, young people, are not oblivious to it. Look at verse 7. While Abraham and Isaac are walking along, Isaac says to his father, Father, Abraham says, here I am, my son. He says, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" In other words, Dad, I can tell a sacrifice is about to happen. 
Because I've seen this scene before. I've watched you, Dad. I've seen you with wood. I've seen you with fire. And I usually see a lamb. And Daddy, I don't see a lamb today. Something strange is going on. Children are not oblivious to what is happening with adults. Children watch us, adults. They watch us. They pick up on things we do. They pick up on our mindsets. They listen to our conversations. I was at a church once and um, we would talk uh, in the ministerial staff about hearing children talking about what their parents were talking about at home about the church. Children listen and they talk about it. They listen to our conversations. They notice what we do and it shapes their mindsets. And when that's harmful, that's another form of sacrifice. And while we see the obviously partisan adult drama playing out in the Supreme Court, and these folks have these positions for life, I believe wholeheartedly that we'll also begin to see young people speaking up once again against the injustices that have put their freedoms in jeopardy. As a matter of fact, while the Supreme Court struck a blow to the LGBTQ community on Friday, saying so-called Christian businesses do not have to serve them, young BIPOC LGBTQ people gathered right in our neighborhood on the south side near, near uh, the museum. And among their gathering declared that they'll actually help those businesses that don't want to serve them. We'll create our own list of open and affirming businesses and not only will you lose our business, You'll lose the business of our allies if allies are willing to stand up and do what is right if they are indeed an ally because we see that we're your sacrifice. And unlike Isaac, we're not just going to lay there and take it. We may be young, but we have the power to impact change. Admissions will be harder at historically white institutions, and young people of color have already begun to say, we see we're your sacrifice. But that's okay, we've got 101 historically black colleges and universities who have educated scholars from Thurgood Marshall to Kamala Harris. And that was only one, Howard University. And if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Young people are not oblivious of being the sacrifice, like Isaac figured out something wasn't right. And as Trinity declared through song, also selected by the Holy Spirit prior to Thursday's events, still these young people will rise. The story continues. Abraham has tied his son to the altar, built just for his son Isaac raises his hand to sacrifice Isaac, and the angel of the Lord stops him. Abraham looks and sees a ram in the bush. If you didn't know that's where that colloquialism came from, that's the text it came from. He sees a ram in the bush and concludes Jehovah Jireh, that God is indeed a provider. Verse 14 says, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. The Hebrew can literally be translated, the Lord will see about it. And I love the English translation of the NRSV, the Lord will provide, but there's something about that literal translation of the Hebrew that makes me feel better about this past week. The idea that the Lord is going to see about it reminds me of times that I needed to go to my children's high school because something was going on. Maybe they kept being selected in this random selection for drug testing and they were cutting hair from my children. And for some reason, they were randomly selected all the time and I had to go up and see about it. The text is telling us in Hebrew that, that God sees injustice and God, according to the Hebrew, is going to see about it. It feels more like a promise that God is looking into the matter and will act on our behalf and will act on behalf of children. 
And I believe that is indeed what God did through God's son, Jesus. In our New Testament text today, allow me to shift to Matthew 19, 13 through 15. It says, then children were being brought to Jesus. Hear this and picture it in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And those adult disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. Once again, and even here, children are caught up in adult drama. Disciples who think Jesus doesn't want to be bothered with children and oversteps their authority, almost sacrificing these children's ability to be touched by Jesus, but Jesus said in verse 14, let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. What is it about children? Innocence, non-discriminatory, hopeful, what is it about children that Jesus says on more than one occasion that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these? Jesus laid his hands on them and went away. We have several children here today, so let me speak to the children for a moment. Children, Jesus loves you. You can always talk to Jesus. You can always learn about Jesus. You should always know that you are loved, you are important, that you are worthy, and that you are welcome here. Children know that with God all things are possible, that God can open any door, provide your needs, help you overcome discrimination and racism. With God all things are possible. Children, now adults, please take this lesson from today's message that we have a responsibility to children, to shield them the best we can from adult drama, to, to advocate for children, all children, to ensure equality for all children, to protect all children. God is not pleased when adults sacrifice children in their drama. And the reality is that a healthy society can be measured by the well-being of the children, not just some children, all children. That's why the sermon title is, How Are the Children? It's taken from the Maasai tribe of East Africa. The Maasai warriors have a greeting they share between one another. And I'm not going to pronounce it perfectly right, but it's something like this. Kaysirian Injera. It means, and how are the children? And their traditional response is, the children are well. When they greet one another, they don't say, hey, how you doing? What's up? Good day. Hi there. They say, how are the children? For they know that children are the most vulnerable in society, and if the children are fine, the society is healthy. So I say to you as I prepare to close, how are the children? If we can't say the children are well, all children are well, then we adults have work to do to protect them, to shield them from powerful but insecure and fearful adults who are seeking self-preservation, seeking to keep their guns, seeking to maintain wealth, and I can go on so much that they'll sacrifice even though they love, like Abraham, willing to sacrifice children and I just wonder when will we speak up maybe we'll begin to speak up if we like the Maasai tribe of East Africa ask on a daily basis how are the children I wonder if decisions when they're about to be made whether it's in the church in the community or in the court before that decision is finalized what if we ask how are the children how will they be once this is implemented?
realizing that we're asking about all, say all children, say that with me, all children. As we prepare to come to the communion table this morning, let us seek healing from times when we were the children caught up in adult drama and our well-being was sacrificed. I heard a minister say a long time ago, there's very few adult issues. There are adults with childhood, unhealed issues. So as we come to the communion, table. Let us, from this point forward, seek healing from those times we were sacrificed. Let us seek healing for our fears, our insecurities, our tendencies towards discrimination, so that we don't harm others while we're trying to protect ourselves. Let us ask forgiveness as we come to the communion table. For times when our words, our actions, our state of mind, our inaction and our votes sacrifice the well-being of children of any race, creed or color, let us be determined as we remember Jesus that he said, let them come to me and forbid them not. As we remember Jesus, let us remember our responsibility to protect, not Jesus as the disciples tried to, but to protect children, to advocate for children and guard the health of society by asking, and how are the children? Let us thank God as we come to the community table that God is not only a provider, but that God is a God who will come and see about it, that God is a God of justice. And in your bulletins, you should see a picture, and soon we'll be hopefully doing bulletins in color, but you should see a picture. Here's my bulletin. On the page where the scriptures are, page six. And it's a cartoon, but it is children who seem to have joy and peace. And there is a diverse group there, and they are enjoying one another and enjoying life. And let us find ways to bring joy to children. May we encourage diverse spaces and teach them to love and respect for all people. May we not teach them to be colorblind, but to see all color and know that this is God's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Children are our hope. The children in your life, whoever they may be, are watching you. They'll be the future Supreme Court justices and the voters and admissions officers and hiring managers of the future. Let us speak up. Let us do justice. Let us be determined to take better care of our children. Let the church say, Amen. <laughs>